2.16 says to the one we are the, an aroma that brings death to the other an aroma that brings life and who is equal to such a task would you bow your heads with me dear Lord this morning as we have this precious opportunity to receive morsels from your word we pray that you'll direct this, this, uh, these words to where you want them to go and that you'll cause them to have the effect that you want them to have in Jesus' name. Amen. During COVID, some people couldn't smell anything that had COVID. Some couldn't taste. I think I could taste, but I couldn't smell. But the sense of smell is one of the five senses. Sight, smell, taste, hearing, and touch. And today we're going to talk about aromas or smells. Each Friday night after work, Bubba would fire up his outdoor grill and cook venison steaks. But all of Bubba's neighbors were Catholic, and since it was Lent, they were forbidden from eating meat on Friday. The delicious aroma from the grilled venison steaks was causing such a problem for the Catholic faithful that they finally talked to their priest so the priest came over to visit Bubba and suggested that he become Catholic. After several classes and much study, Bubba attended Mass, and as the priest sprinkled holy water over him, he said, you were born a Baptist, you were raised a Baptist, but now you are a Catholic. Bubba's neighbors were greatly relieved until Friday night arrived, and the wonderful aroma of grilled venison again filled the neighborhood. The priest was called immediately by the neighbors, and as he rushed into Bubba's yard clutching a rosary, preparing to scold him, he stopped and watched in amazement. There Bubba stood, clutching a small bottle of holy water, which he carefully sprinkled over the grilling meat, and he chanted, You was born a deer, you was raised a deer, but now you is a catfish. <laughs> it was the aroma that led to the problem with the neighbors. We're talking about aromas today. Second Corinthians chapter 2, 14 to 16. But thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's pri triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we, are giving, for we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are an aroma that brings death. To the other, an aroma that brings life and who is equal to such a task. Aromas. I think it is true that women have better sense of smell than men do. I mean, Carol says, what's that smell? I don't smell anything. I don't smell anything. But I think women do have a better sense of smell. I don't know why that would be, but it's true. Aromas um, used, to be, used to be part of life more so than they are now because we're so sanitized. All the aromas are wrapped up in plastic and put in the trash. But part of a physician's diagnosis years ago used to be scent. The smell of a person's breath or other things could indicate what the illness was. Now it's all about tests, MRIs, CAT scans, x-rays, digital readouts. They don't use aroma diagnostics anymore. There's nothing wrong with that. All the tests are more accurate than the aromas, but the aroma in the kitchen gives us a hint of what the food will taste like. Sometimes if we are cooking something here in the basement, I forget the, what the last one was. Maybe it was uh, stuffed shells or maybe it was uh, chili or something down there. But, you know, the aroma comes up here and then we know what's cooking. <laughs> we had an employee one time in our photo studio that we used to, that was our business, 
who wore a particular kind of perfume, only one kind that she would wear. When I got to work in the morning, I knew if she was there because as soon as I opened the door, I could smell her perfume, even though she was way back in the back of the building. But when she came in, she left a scent trail of that perfume. So I was able to tell years ago what kind of film I had by the smell of it. I remember in Illinois, I asked the boss's son, who was about 16 at the time, I said, load me up 10 rolls of Tri-X, that's a, a film, and it's 35 millimeter, you buy it in bulk and you, you load it up into these little cassettes for in the camera. And so he proceeded to load up the film and when I took, when I opened the can and took the film out, I could tell by the smell of the film that it was not Tri-X. It was, a, it, was a, it was a slower film. If I'd have used it for Tri-X, I would have came out unexposed. The pictures would have been unusable. So scent is an is a important part of life. Paul lived in the time of uh, the Roman power, the Roman Empire, when a Roman commander conquered a new territory for Rome. He would request from the Senate to go in a triumphal procession through Rome. If he made it through a series of qualifications, then he was called the Triumphator, and he was paraded through the city along with the spoils of his conquest. The Triumphator was specially adorned for this ceremony. He traded out his regular toga for a completely purple toga, a color not typically worn by Romans because it symbolized royalty. His face was painted red in reference to the red statue of Jupiter, the patron god of Rome. And finally, he would be crowned in the um, laurel crown, symbolizing his victory, and pulled in a chariot by four white horses. He was preceded by the spoils of his newly conquered land. Exotic animals, gold, jewels, spices, incense, and a band of captives from the conquered peoples. And his army would follow him in celebration. At the end of the parade, he, the conquered people were ceremonially slaughtered in front of the temple of Jupiter. At the height of the use of this Roman ceremony, it would, this would happen about every three to five years. Christ, however, is constantly leading his people in victory. He's the commander. We are his captives. We don't get dead. We are saved from death by Christ and we are, the, we are his captives. The aroma of the knowledge of him. The aroma brings death and the aroma brings life. The aroma is the gospel. Aromas are important to God. Ezekiel 20, 41. As a, as a soothing aroma, I will accept you when I bring you out from the peoples and gather you from the lands where you are scattered and I will prove myself holy among you in the sight of the nations. The required sacrifices in Leviticus, animals, grain, liquids, were burned on the altar. The bird offerings were an aroma pleasing to the Lord. So is the smell of burning flesh, hide, fat, something God enjoys? The burnt smell or the aroma is the evidence of the sacrifice. The burning flesh is odious, it stinks, but the offering pleased God. The sacrifice was the obedience and how and how they obeyed and sacrificed in a burnt offering. In 2 Corinthians, the word in Greek means fragrance. Fragrance that brings life, fragrance that brings death. We carry the fragrance that brings both life and death. You carry the fragrance. You carry 
that aroma. <clears throat> the fragrance that you carry is not a death fragrance. It's a life fragrance. But it's a fragrance of death to the perishing. It's a fragrance of death to those that reject the gospel. A fragrance of death to those who refuse to believe. To them the aroma is objectionable. The message of the gospel is objectionable. It doesn't fit with uh, their lifestyle. It doesn't fit in with their worldview. The aroma is the good news. It's the gospel. The good news that Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sins. The good news is that we can have forgiveness when we believe and receive in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's the good news. That's the aroma. We are transformed from the stinking, rotten, sin life of death to the clean life of a holy believer. God made us holy. We can't make ourselves holy. He cleans us up. We can't clean ourselves. We can't be good enough. We can't do enough good works to buy our way into heaven. But thanks to Jesus, we are forgiven and we have the imputation of his righteousness on us. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That's the aroma that brings life. And we have it. It's on us and it's in us. First Peter chapter 1, 3 to 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in his great mercy. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. Just think of it. The Son of God came to this sinful world, was rejected by those he came to seek and to save, allowed himself to be abused, nailed to a cross, allowed his precious blood to spill on this vile earth. Just think of it. Jesus took all the sins of mankind from Adam to the end onto himself on the cross. I was represented at the cross by my sin, and so were you. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Just think of it. We're made holy. We can't make ourselves holy. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 to 4, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The aroma of death. Isaiah 5, 20, 21. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. That's today. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness? Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter? Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. That's today. And it's becoming more and more mainstream. There's an evil agenda. It's no coincidence that so many ungodly cultural affectations are surfacing. This country was founded on Judeo-Christian principles and values. There is a religion of the, it sounds like, it, it rhymes with joke, but I'm not saying that word. It starts with W and rhymes with joke. There is a religion of the far left radicals 
whose thoughts are becoming mainstream. Do you remember the hippies? Some of you, you're all old enough to remember hippies, probably. Can you guys remember hippies? <laughs> Do you remember the LSD-infested, mind-bent radicals? We lived in California during that time. Do you know where they went? Some of them became born-again Christians. Some of them became college professors on the left-leaning college campuses like Berkeley. Passing their godless radical ideals to students who are the lefty professors of today. And now it's filtering down to our schools. And this is an agenda. They have sacred beliefs that no one can challenge. You get, what do they call it? Erased? Well, they get, what are they, there's a word for that, but you get erased. Abortion on demand at any stage is sacred to them. Baby killing is a sacrament to the godless radical left. The gay rights movement is another tenet of this radical religion. You don't dare criticize them or you're branded as homophobic. The newest wrinkle in this hideous agenda is the gender confusion that they're imposing on children. I don't think an elementary school student is going to examine their feelings and see if they really are the gender that they are born with, unless there's a suggestion being made. There has to be a suggestion. There has to be some suggestion that this is possible. The idea has to come from somewhere. Oh, you can have a new name and new pronouns and medication to change your gender but don't tell your parents this is a sad day when that kind of stuff can happen here and that's what that lady was talking about i don't even need to mention men and women's sports men and women's bathrooms and locker rooms and there are people that think there's nothing wrong with that well the women that are in there think there's a lot wrong with it and look what they did to Riley Gaines. She had to have, she had, to have bodyguards and, be, and she had to lock herself in a room in a college because people were attacking her because she was complaining about men, biologically complete men in the locker room. And they were attacking her for that. Parents who show up at school board meetings to complain about that sort of thing, are branded as terrorists and put on the FBI's watch list. Now we have Supreme Court justice who doesn't know what a woman is. And she are one. Another one of their sacred tenets is the climate cult. It started with global warming and then climate started to cool. So now they call it climate change. There are scientists who don't agree with the theory that human activity causes climate change. I know there's metric tons of sulfur dioxide or, or carbon stuff in the atmosphere and they think that's causing climate change. The last ice age didn't thaw because of coal burning power. The last ice age didn't thaw because of combustion engines. There weren't any coal burning power plants. There weren't any power plants. There weren't any combustion engines. The last ice age didn't thaw because of cow flatulence or because of what kind of light bulbs we use. There weren't any light bulbs, but the ice age came to it, came to it an end. There are, you can find scientists on YouTube that have a, an opposing theory. I don't have time today to get, to get into all of that, but this agenda is about control. We're expected to enter into treaties or agreements that impose fees on developed countries to help undeveloped countries to wean off of fossil fuels. 
What's wrong with that? I don't want my country and I live in to be subject to rules that come from an offshore multinational entity governing what we do with our energy. What's wrong with that? It's the beginning of globalism. Why do the radicals want an invasion of our southern border? Globalism. The Assyrian Empire was an effort to subdue the world under one empire. The Babylonian Empire. The Roman Empire. And down to this age, Hitler's attempt to conquer the world. They were all evil, brutal, murderous dictators. And now Marxism, socialism, China, North Korea, Cuba. You know what they do? They put a wedge in between parents and their children. What are they trying to do in the schools? You don't have to tell your parents. Marxism, socialism, as opposed to any religion, it's the goal of globalists to have an atheist, one world government. The final empire will be a true global government ruled by the man known as the Antichrist, also called the beast and a lawless one. He will have authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. And he, along with the false prophet, will force all people to take his mark. This future global leader, global leader will control all financial transactions and all religious observance. Refusal to worship the Antichrist means death. Acquiescence means eternal punishment from God. The Bible therefore shows that any time man attempts globalization, going back all the way to the Tower of Babel, it is ruled by wicked, ungodly empires. We should oppose globalization to the extent that we understand that it is implemented by Satan, currently the god of this age. Only globalization that I can support is the one that will be ruled by Jesus Christ himself when he returns. Our aroma is the aroma of death to those who are perishing. Those who oppose the truth are perishing. Those who agree with all these things, abortion on demand, gay rights, transgenderism, globalism, they're on the wrong side of God. Romans 1, 18 to 32, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the image is made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who was forever praised, amen. Verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. 
They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these things, but also approve of those who practice them. That's what's going on in the world today. That was going on back then, it's going on now. But it's the, it's the mainstream. They are in slavery. Satan has them. We are the aroma of Christ to those who are practicing any kind of evil. We are the aroma of death. We carry the gospel. They are opposed to the gospel. They don't want to hear it. Being a Christian is a death sentence in North Korea. Christians are persecuted in China and other places. I can remember being a sinner, not wanting anything to do with God people, not wanting to hear the good news. I was lost. I was a sinner. I was without excuse. Thanks to God, thanks to my Savior, thanks to the Holy Spirit. I turned my life around. God turned me around. To all who are evil, the gospel which we carry is odious. I hate it. To them it stinks. The same aroma, the aroma of Christ, the good news that the penalty has been paid. The good news that God loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That aroma, which is so odious to the perishing, to the promoters of the radical agenda today, is the aroma of life to us who believe. One aroma, two reactions, two effects. The aroma is like light. Matthew 5, 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Acts 26 18 to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me so the question is how is your aroma how is your light can people see it I'm not talking about how you smell. I'm just talking about how your spirit is and how it's revealed to other people. Can they, I mean, can they tell that you're a believer? To those who are perishing, they don't want to hear it. But if you talk to somebody about God, it's not going to go away in their mind. All the people that, that, that mentioned God to me, you know, I didn't want to hear it. I hated what they were saying, but those words stayed with me and brought me around to Christ later. That's what this whole thing is about. Letting your light shine. Letting that aroma. That you were born again. And that's why you have peace. People wonder, why, do you, why are you so peaceful? Why are you calm? Tell them. <laughs> because I have a Lord. Because I have a Savior. I like to talk to people that I, that I never saw. I just say, just say, we were on our vacation. There was a we went in a restaurant. Terrible food. It was a fancy restaurant. Terrible food. Worst I ever had. But there was a whole uh, family, a black family there. I, I just walked over to say hello to them. 
I didn't know who they were. Never saw them in my life before. How you folks doing? Oh, we're doing pretty good. How about you? Well, life's hard, but God is good. And they said, all the time. That's my little test, my little probe. God is good if I get that answer back all the time. Then I know I'm talking to some believers. Total strangers. Let your light shine. Amen. Well, I would be remiss in my obligation if I didn't offer to pray with people who have any kind of needs. So would you stand and um, come on down? And if anybody has, needs to be anointed and prayed for,